Hello and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Veronica Phil, the CEO of Grounded Foods. Hi, Hi Veronica. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Yep, very, very well in sunny California. Can you tell me um, about your journey so far to come to LA? So you're originally uh, Australian um, yep, uh, from yep. Melbourne? Yep, yep. And yeah, it's been a pretty wild time to decide to launch a business. Uh, during COVID of all times. So we came from Melbourne where my husband and I had a fine dining restaurant. Uh, I could, you know, for, for the last couple of years of that restaurant, even though it was doing really, really well. Um, in fact, we were, I think the only pre-ticketed restaurant in Australia at the time. Uh, so you couldn't even walk in without buying tickets. Like it was some kind of show. Uh, look, Heart of its success, but I just knew that something was not, I guess, not looking promising in, in the industry. Um, my partner was working, you know, 80, 100 hours a week, super unsustainable. Um, and I think that the move in the dining industry was becoming increasingly casualised. Uh, there were a lot of, you know, entrenched workplace issues, wage issues. And I just didn't think that it was sustainable anymore. Uh, so we were looking at other, other things that we could do with our skill set. So, you know, he's been a chef for, I think, nearly 20 years at this point. Um, amazingly talented at making food that's not what it seems. So just the whole, the magic around creating stuff that, you know, out of ingredients that you never expect, that's really his talent there. Whereas I'm from a business marketing economics background. So we're thinking, what can we do you know, together so that we can spend more time together, I guess, and just make our lives, our business as well. Uh, and uh, I guess a, a plant-based food line just seemed like a natural progression taking those skill sets and being able to not only do the R&D but also having the skills to brand it and market it and bring it to market. And we had heaps of different ideas at the time um, but the one that I thought had the most legs just judging by where we were at in the, in the marketing trends at the time was plant-based cheese. So I think Sean had all sorts of different dishes that he was serving in our restaurant at one stage he was doing you know a cheese a cheese course that it took a year before he told anyone that it wasn't real um and then when I when I heard that I'm like hang on hang on what's in it and he told me at the time it was made out of potato and really not a lot else and I'm like well hang on so there's no nuts or soy or like any of these other things in it do you realize what you've done dude do you realise what you've done? Um, and I think I just immediately, the business plan started taking shape in my head. And over the next few months, I was just, it was a journey of me just convincing my partner to completely leave behind the career that he'd spent his entire life building um, to this really successful point. And just trust me on this one. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So he left and we, yeah, we set up Grounded Foods to specialise in plant-based cheese out of ingredients that haven't been used before. And in terms of the restaurant you had uh, in Melbourne, was that um, also a plant-based restaurant or were you doing all types of dietary? Uh... It wasn't. It was not plant-based at all. Sean and I are not vegan ourselves. Uh, I just recognised that, I mean, that's the way the market is going. Um, and, you know, I think that the purpose of a restaurant should be to serve people and be hospitable and give people the food that, they want to enjoy and people were asking for plant-based so we just tailored the menu that way and I think for a chef it's a much more creative way of cooking because Sean's far more interested in I guess vegetables and using at the time animal proteins more just as a, an accent or a highlight of flavour to the dish but his mm. focus was always more on what he can do out of vegetables, fermentation, all of these different techniques uh, that are not usually, you know, it's, it's not an easy win as it is in, you know, at the time of just putting a steak on a dish with some potatoes. Um, I think it's, it gives you opportunity to be far more creative. So that's how he came up with cheese made from cauliflower. 
Mm. And you, you have to be creative at the moment with cheese because uh, I would say <laughs> it's not, not quite there yet, is it, in terms of like the stuff that you get in the market today that is no. predominantly coconut based, very starchy, I guess, and the flavours aren't there and also the consistency depending on the usage, uh, what you're using it for. That's exactly it. And I mean, I, I was born in the 80s. My parents were a bit hippie like they grew they brought me up on a very natural organic like whole foods diet but they were yeah. feeding me these cheeses back in the 80s and not much has changed it's still it felt like you know being the age that I am now and trying the cheeses in the supermarket it's still the same stuff um, and it's either I think it's a bit more interesting now that you've got at the more premium end of the market the nut-based ones mm. um, but in all honesty for People like me and Sean who are not vegan, they're not compelling enough to get us, I guess, to buy them instead of normal cheese. We'd just buy normal cheese. And that to me was the real white space in the market. Like there's none of these brands are actually trying to attract and obtain mainstream customers with something that's far more interesting, far more complex, uh, far more delicious in flavour, but also importantly, that reaches customers at the same price point because if they're not... Yeah. If they're not vegan, why would they buy that? Mm, yeah. So, you, yeah, you've got to remove these barriers in order to make it something that realistically people would try out for the first time, would potentially buy sometimes instead of dairy, not necessarily all the time. Uh, but I think that it's a very similar strategy to what Beyond and Impossible have used, just trying to really hit that mainstream audience with a much more compelling product. How do you plan to do that, especially going after the mainstream audience? Because that's the that's the growth area there, you know, and that's where you've you've got the convincing to do um, in order for them to try your product. What's the main sort of marketing message you want to push to them? We're vegan by stealth. Uh, right. You won't find you won't find the word vegan on our packaging because yep. that's not the audience that we're going for. And I think that looking all of the research that mm. I've done into this and that, I mean, there's, if you even Google it, there's a lot of research that's been done on the negative perceptions people have around the word vegan. Um, yeah. Just psychologically, I think for mainstream consumers, when you call a product vegan, instead of something like simply plant-based, yeah. it immediately makes people feel like it's not going to taste as good. Like maybe mm. they've had bad experiences in the past that they're bringing into their heads when they, when they see that word, um, especially with vegan cheese. Like we did not call this a vegan cheese, even though it's plant-based just because vegan cheeses have tasted like shit for so long <laughs> <laughs> that people wouldn't buy it. Yeah. Um, but it, it also gives people, I think that sense that something's been taken away from the product instead of adding additional value, which is what we're trying to do. I think, when you say it's vegan cheese, people think, oh, it must be a compromise then. They must be taking something away in terms of flavour or texture or something like that. Whereas what we're essentially trying to do is create a new category of food. It's a, Anyone can enjoy it just because it's freaking delicious. It yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, before me uh, turning vegan plant-based, uh, you know, our family, my, my daughters would, would love um, to have uh, camembert, um, so yep. and baked camembert uh, in yep. the oven with with some garlic and and then taking some bread. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's one of the things we haven't got quite. Uh, you know, we haven't replaced that yet. So yeah. Uh, so when you when you speak about the texture and the taste, um, how close is it to you know camembert as in the traditional sense? It's close enough that it managed to trick restaurant diners for a year without anyone yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and look, we, I think the difference here is that our company is still just the two of us. We haven't hired anyone else yet. We, we got it to this stage with just two people, I guess, knowing what cheese tastes like, and I'm a pretty harsh critic of my partner as you can imagine and he I would probably be his harshest critic just because I love to criticize everything that he cooks <laughs> yeah. but look, the, I think as a chef your reputation is around is the flavor yeah. of your food yeah so yeah. I think coming from being quite a high profile chef in Australia like Sean has been 
there's no way that he can put his name to something if it doesn't taste amazing. He would just never, never do that. Um, so to have him put something out there that he's proud to be associated with, to me is testament to the fact that it's pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, but we, and we just wouldn't, like we're not creating a company just for the sake of it. There's all sorts of things that we could have done when we left the restaurant. But I think he'd created something so insanely unique and innovative um, and something that we were so proud of in terms of the flavour and consistency and the fact that like people were wanting to buy it that would never normally eat vegan cheese. Um, that's when I knew that there was really something in there. Uh, and I don't think we even realised at the time that there was just nothing like it on the market. I mean, we were quite shocked that no one had done it this way yeah. before. And and are you you're fermenting your cheese as well? Are you um, adding like yeast to it? To, is that part of the process? Is that what how you make the cheesy flavour? No, no, there's nothing like that added. It's all traditional fermentation that's based around the cauliflower like leaves. So we use imperfect vegetables because we don't need the ones that are expensive or go into the supermarkets. We just need the the crappy ones with the bruised bruised heads and broken leaves and everything um, and we try and upcycle as much as we can so that that's actually where all of the flavor comes from that's where our IP is all based um, so when we you know I think we're not used to as entrepreneurs thinking about IP and patents mm. and that kind of thing it's not something that you do in the restaurant industry you can't actually get IP protection around a recipe. But we realised over time that it's actually the process and that no one had done it this way before. So that's mm. that was the core of it. Um, and that is, yeah, where we get all of the flavour of the product. So it forms the basis of all of our recipes. We've got about 35 different cheeses at the moment. We're not going to market with all 35 just yet, but that's yeah. the roadmap. Yeah. Uh, and then we introduced, well, this is, I'm speaking for Sean, but he introduced hemp seed to the mix as well because that's just one, it's a fascinating ingredient to work with. It's incredibly nutrient dense and just so versatile. Yeah, totally. Um, but, yeah. but that way he was able to, I guess, reintroduce the, some of that protein and calcium that's lost by not eating real dairy cheese. And yeah. that's something that's lacking in a lot of the products on the market right now is just any nutrients whatsoever. Um, but also it means that you can start to get that fat content back again without relying on coconut oil as yeah. the basis of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah, so I, I think from what we saw, a lot of the recipes or the formulations out there right now, it's all really similar. Like if it's not the nut based side, it's just block of coconut oil with some kind of starched starch mixed in like potato, tapioca, bean starch, whatever it is, and then flavor mm. additives. Um, and I think that's a really it's actually pretty good. They've got it to a pretty good point where you can put it on pizza. A lot of people are happy with that. Um, but as I said earlier, it's not something that we would buy. So we were trying to create something that we would eat. Yeah. So the, the hemp seed uh, oil is actually a really good idea because it's very, you know, cold, cold pressed. It's got a lot of nutrients in, in the oil itself. So yeah. So that adds to the flavor as well. Um, the, we actually I, try not to get the flavor in it. A yeah, lot I was going to say, because the, sla yeah. the flavor is actually sort of, yeah, quite potent, isn't it? Yeah, the, yeah. So it's, it's more yeah. for the nutritional benefits and the fats. Yeah, we, we don't use hemp seed oil in it. We use whole hemp seed. Um, right. But that's a, a big part of it, I think, for a lot of businesses that are working with hemp as a, an ingredient at the moment is masking some of that flavor so that it doesn't come out really strongly. I have no idea how Sean's managed to, to get rid of that flavor. I, yeah. I think some people love it, but I think the majority of people aren't used to it yet. So when you're talking about a scalable business that's hitting a mainstream audience, I think it's important not for that flavor to be overpowering. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think if you use the oil, that's a bit of a punch in the face of <laughs> flavor. <laughs> yeah, totally. So you've, uh, achieved a lot with just the two of you um but i guess there's there's been ups and downs in in creating this uh, startup journey um have you had any horror stories so far and you know how have you gone about sort of solving it and uh, overcoming it and finding other solutions yeah every every week is just another level of just all right what next <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so much so that I started to put it into my pitch when I was pitching investors oh, right. in, okay. our, in our last fundraising round. And, you know, they always, you're told that they're looking for the founders. It's such an early stage business right, like yeah. we are where we're pre-revenue. Um, all they've got to go on is the, the skills of the founders and how much they believe in them. So yeah. without a lot to show in terms of revenue or sales, we're like, well, this is what we've done over the last six months. You know, we've left our, our hometown in Australia, in Melbourne. We left everything there. We left our home, our family, our friends, um, and put all of our savings into getting to the US and all of their savings, to be honest, as well, um, on a very, very short time frame. So we literally had a week to get our stuff together after we had an investment offer and an unexpected investment offer from Big Idea Ventures. Um, we had a week to pack everything up, just leave, a, you know, put everything else in storage or just get rid of it and move to New York uh, to commercialise our products. Yeah. Once, I mean, once we... Sorry. So I was just going to jump in. Uh, was one of the reasons that they wanted you that in New York was there, obviously that's their main HQ, but they also have a Singapore office with Big Ideas Ventures. So, but they, they wanted really you to be in the, in, in the US market. No, that was our choice. So okay. look, just looking at the market, I think the reason why we were so attracted to the US is just market size. Um, Australia was, I think, too small for us, even though we had a lot of demand for our products in Australia, I think we could have done really well there. It's just to me being a big fish in a very small pond, whereas I'd rather challenge ourselves and take on, you know, the, the market in Australia is like that compared to the US. Um, and I think that would have been a similar experience in Singapore. And I also think that in Asian cultures, like dairy is not a huge pivotal part of the market anyway. So we would have been very limited from day one going into that audience as a first stop to establish ourselves. We figured, look, let's go to, to the place where we'll have the biggest opportunities and the biggest impact from day one and then start thinking about international expansion from there. But baby steps, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah. So, not that moving to the US is a baby step. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a big step. Um <laughs> especially when there's a pandemic gone when you when you arrive in New York, I guess. Well, we didn't know that at the time. Um <laughs> yeah, but, <I> <laughs> but we we got we got there in November and we look, we just came in on the um the Esther visa, which is just the temporary one yep. that Australians can get to go yep. there. With that visa, you can't actually work there. So we couldn't, once we got to the US, we realised we can't actually sell our products to anyone. Um, all we can do is take part in the accelerator program and learn um, and just, you know, try and set as much as we can up behind the scenes without actually technically working on anything. Uh, so Sean just kept developing, you know, the flavours and thinking about different ways of doing things. We were just getting patents, all of these, or just setting up the infrastructure, um, speaking to investors. And then finally in, in Feb this year, we had our, our working visas cleared so that we could finally start actually giving people samples of the products, getting them to taste it, get it out there. Uh, and we were able to do that for two weeks before everything went into lockdown and just the floor just <laughs> fell from underneath us. Uh, so in that two weeks, we managed to make heaps of progress. We had about 150 customers that were signed up, um, restaurant customers ready to buy our products, just waiting for us to go into production. Uh, we had some really major partners as well. Um, and then when COVID hit, everything just went silent. So we had to very quickly work mm -hmm. out how to, I guess, navigate what I thought would be a very, very rapidly changing environment since even government poly policy makers had no idea what was going on at the time and were just flying by the seat of their pants <laughs> kind of thing, which is largely still what's going on, I guess. Um, but I think what, what worked in our favour was that half of Grounded is not only 
an R&D chef on one side, but an economist on the other side. So if anyone's going to be able to try and navigate and predict what might happen next in the market, I'd like to think that I'd have some, some level of insight there. So our next, our next step was just to immediately, I hate to say it, but cut all of the restaurant channel off at the limb just because we don't know what's going to happen with that. And we didn't want to put any more resources into, I guess, you know, focusing too much on that distribution channel before we understand the lay of the landscape. Um, our, our next potential channel was to think about, all right, what if we go straight into, into retail instead? But then retailers were not taking any meetings. They weren't taking any samples at the time that COVID hit just because they were trying to work out their own existing supply chains and just mm. get their, get their and, stuff together. And they also together. have cycles, their own cycles that they go with in terms of where, when they're reviewing products and that would... I ignore them. those cycles because to be a hustler, you've got to just tell people, no, you're trying it now. You can't get in there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the difference. Like we just ignore protocol. We, yeah. we have no care for tradition, um, formalities, we know what we want to achieve and we just navigate and find different ways to get there. I think that's largely why we've been able to get to where we are so quickly. Um, mm. we're, we're, we're deviant minded, put it yeah, that yeah. way, uh, in a good way. Um, but we realised, look, retail is probably not the best option for us either right now. Uh, so we, you know, what's left after that, I guess, direct to consumer. So yeah. our next step was to figure, all right, look, we're not, anywhere near production, that would be months away, but we've got nothing to lose. Why don't we just have a crack at doing online sales and getting pre-orders for a product that no one in this country has tasted yet and nobody knows who we are. May as well have a crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but, but we, now, yeah. now on your website, you're sold out of those uh, pre-orders already. We, we sold out in 48 hours. We made five grand in the first 48 hours. And that was all of the stock that we were able to make by hand. Um, right. And then we started getting the angry emails from people wanting camembert. Like, why can't I get the camembert? It's still, why is it still sold out? This makes me very, very angry. And I'm like, okay. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, look, it, it doesn't sound like a lot of money in the scheme of things, but I think when you're a completely unknown brand no one's tried the products before we didn't put any marketing behind it i think that just it speaks to how much interest there are there is in plant-based cheese at the moment the fact that people went berserk for it and i, I think it's just honestly with all products in the plant-based space at the moment people are going bonkers for it um, yeah. at the time like you couldn't even get food in the supermarket when covid first hit so i think people's eyes were online they were desperate to order stuff just to be able to get anything that they could so that's probably part of why we did really well with direct to consumer sales just yeah. at the start and you've uh, you've shipped that that batch out already now uh the ones that pre-ordered who managed to get there yeah quickly. um it was a painful you... that was another painful process because okay. we realized you know we, we did the online sales for a couple of months once we started producing that batch and they take a little bit of time to age, so people had to wait months for these cheeses, ah, okay, right. very patiently. Right. Um, but when we when we got to the stage of actually shipping out the orders, uh, the courier companies like the FedEx and UPS and everything were no longer guaranteeing two two day deliveries. Which, I mean, normally like all of our customers had paid for two day deliveries so that they can receive the products nicely chilled um, yes. and you know fresh. Yeah. But now suddenly the game had changed and the delivery companies were saying, yeah, we're still doing two day delivery, but it might take two days. It might take two weeks. We can't guarantee it anymore. So we had just this horrible moment where the, the first few orders we sent out, it was getting hugely delayed and we were starting to have to refund and resend stuff out because by the time it arrived to people, it had been too long. Yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't chilled. So like, I guess it, it, it does it need in the packaging, it needs to be like, minus 18 or something uh, fortunate look fortunately our product is very very stable because it's fermented and just due to the salt acid ratios it's actually really stable outside of the fridge for a long time so i will eat our camembert for instance even if it's been outside of the fridge for a week and i'm still okay <laughs> yeah. but you, you don't want to test that on 
you know, on no. consumers. And I think a lot of people just wouldn't trust a product that's not arriving chilled. And that, like, that's the way that it should arrive to people. We don't want them to have to make compromises with that. Um, so we had this really difficult decision of like, oh God, do we, we're either going to lose a lot of money in refunding people or we're going to lose a lot of money in having to reship the products or just pay ourselves out of our own money for like overnight express shipping. So, so that was a, a tricky right. decision. We did the numbers. We decided, you know what, we'll just, we'll just pay out of pocket for overnight express shipping for everyone. Um, and yeah, that seemed to, we managed to get through hundreds of orders that way without losing yeah. too much money. I call it a marketing expense, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and what was the feedback from, from those customers? Uh, people seem to love it. Like every, honestly, every time someone tastes it, they say that it's the best one they've ever tried. Uh, what I'm, I think that's just, typical of the responses we get from our vegan customers and we get really lovely emails from them as well like I've had some epic ones um, that I, I think I'll have to put on on the website as testimonials yeah. because people get really excited about it which is awesome um, but what I'm really excited by is the non-vegan consumers that try the products and love them like that means a lot to me because that tells us yeah. that yeah we're, we're on the right track here in that case um, and one of the crazily one of the products that does really really well with non-vegans is our cream cheese made up made out of hemp yeah um, i have no idea why i don't even eat cream cheese the only reason we made it was because someone asked us to when we were in new york because obviously bagels you know yeah yeah totally. cream cheese we, yeah. so so sean just made it one afternoon it was just like yeah. hey have a taste of this what do you think and i'm like yeah. that's pretty solid that tastes exactly like cream cheese um yeah. But we found that it's, yeah, it's non-vegans that go nutty for that one. <laughs> is, it, is it because, Who knew? You, yeah, you, on the, I think I saw on the site, you've got one uh, which has got uh, truffle oil, black truffle oil uh, and, and <laughs> yeah. garlic. It looks quite, yeah. quite nice. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's quite, quite a good one. It's well, the, the one that we're selling at the moment is um, we only did that as a little one off. Oh, okay. And I think, you, you know, in all honesty, put, black garlic and truffle oil in anything and it tastes good immediately uh, so that's an easy win but the one that we're actually selling is just garlic and i mean onion and chives, chives and yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so it's wonderful to see feedback from people that wouldn't normally consider a plant-based option actually yeah. preferring that to dairy which is the feedback that we're getting so yeah fantastic knew? Um, so what's your opinion about the companies, uh, the startups in, in, the, in, uh, in the sector that are creating cell based alternatives, uh, versus yours, which is like vegetable based. Yeah. I look, I think it's really exciting as well. Honestly, I think that whatever cell based work is being done into dairy and the cheese side of things, at least like they'll, they'll crack it. They'll come up with something that is far superior than anything that we can make out of just plants alone at this stage. But I also think that that's a really long way away. Um, and we, once they get there, we'll use that as an ingredient for our products. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's just, um, when you say a long way, what, what would you say that is, uh, how, how many years down the road? Oh, I, look, in order to make it a commercially scalable product, I think it's still a couple of years away at least. And if I think about, um, there's a fantastic bunch of guys in Australia called Val who are making plant-based meats down there out of like all different strains of animal, literally like a Noah's Ark of an animal library that they're creating, but they can only create like a tiny, tiny, amount of it at a time like mm, yeah it's not scary. literally just grams yeah. at a time yeah. um but they need to secure the science first so that's where the focus needs to be on getting that science locked in first making it viable and then thinking about scaling it later so i think we're still a few years away from that it'll be amazing once it hits mm. um but then i also think there's going to be this quite long period of getting used to it so I think for a lot of consumers, it might be difficult to think about eating something that's been created in a lab, even though 
Like if you look at our food system, not a lot of it is natural anymore anyway. I think they'd be pretty horrified to know where their food really comes from, especially yeah. in the US. Um, yeah, especially but, yeah. your, you know, you raise more, more whole, whole foods. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but look, for us, we just figured if we can make camembert out of cauliflower and get it to taste and function the way that it does, then clearly we haven't explored the full potential of vegetables yet. Mm, totally. And yeah. fermentation, just traditional techniques. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the cell-based ones are looking at trying to replicate like casein um, yeah, that you have as, as cheese and trying to yeah, yeah. Um, look at the, the protein uh, molecules within that. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, so, that's the, the tricky part is the, the casein with these totally, cheeses, yeah. because that's where you get, for instance, the stretch in mozzarella. And it's the big thing that's missing in texture in a lot of products that are on the market right now. And I've even mm. seen, a, I don't know if you've got Trader Joe's over there, but it's really popular over here. And they have a plant based cheese that contains, it contains casein. It's like, that's cheating. You can't, it's an animal product. You can't put it in there and still market it as a plant-based cheese why are they doing that that's strange i get they're they're not calling it vegan i guess that's oh, okay. the but it's like that's that's still, still <laughs> plant -based, yeah yeah but I, I think a lot of people don't pay attention because a lot wouldn't know what casein actually is and where it's derived so yeah calling you out trader joe's that's <laughs> shifty <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so you you have a strong vision uh, of where you want to be. Uh, can you describe what that is and, and what your mission is now to get there? Um, so you've got a production company as well to help you now scale up. Is that right? Yeah, so we're using a co-packer based in Los Angeles. Uh, look, our vision is to take every single one of the most popular cheeses on the market and replicate them one by one in plant-based format. So we're doing that under two different brands. Grounded is just the first brand that we're launching with, direct to consumer. Yeah. Uh, we'll be releasing our second one earlier next year. Um, I won't give you too much information on that so that we don't give our competitors a head start. Yeah, but on... that's <laughs> for a different sector. It's not it absolutely, would... absolutely. That's the different area of the market. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and uh, you're, you've managed to raise uh, a, good, a good bunch of uh, venture funds uh, that have got involved now. Uh, obviously, I think thanks to the initial one with um, BIV. Uh, Sorry about the barking dog in the background. <laughs> um, but you've also got uh, Stray Dog Capital, uh, Veg, Invest Trust, Glasswall Syndicate. The, the, those are the main ones, right? Yeah, so we just closed our series seed round uh, that was led by Stray Dog Capital and also had Rakana, Inve Rakana Ventures involved, um, Glasswall Syndicate, so a group of plant-based angel investors from around the world, uh, and yeah, Veg Invest Trust as well. Yeah, and uh, so the total now that you've raised is is one is that one point seven four, and then whatever you've you know the BIV initial fund as well. So we've raised just under two million for, two, yeah. for this round. Yeah. So what's your so we're uh, August now. So what's your plans uh, for that investment now for the until the end of the year? Say everything. Everything changes now. We can finally go from being a two person team. So at the moment I do everything business marketing sales wise and Sean does everything creative. So he does everything from our photography to building the website, you know, graphic design for all of our packaging and labels. He's incredible. He's like, he, I watch him sitting there every day and he's, you know, learning to do in 24 hours what a graphic designer has just gone to university to do. And he's just trying yeah. to cram it into his head and he yes. comes up like, I don't know how he creates this stuff, but he manages to pull it off and it's always yeah, amazing. Say, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the packaging looks great. You know, the, the brand is strong. Um, so yeah, he's done well, hasn't he? He's got, a, he's got a good eye for aesthetics and I think that's the fine dining chef coming out. Is they've got a good eye for plating and how to make things, you know, beautiful. Um, but we're super excited that now with money hitting our bank accounts, we can hire people to help us and I can get him back in touch, 
back into the kitchen and doing what he does best, which is just R and D. And I think that he's got a really unique gift. And the sooner I can get him out of doing the day to day rigmarole and you know regulatory forms and all of that, and just back to creating and you know building magic, then the better. Yeah. And um, when are you going to be ready to launch? Uh, you know your lar- larger scale offering. Now uh, we'll be relaunching online in November and through selected retailers and with some big quick service restaurant partners as well that have managed to do very well during during COVID, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, and can you name any of those just yet or not not yet until November time? I won't just yet. I'll, I'll wait for instruction from their marketing teams. I'd probably right. need to liaise with them on that one. Yeah, totally. Okay, so yes, so thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, yeah, really happy what you've achieved so far with just, just the two of you. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to try some. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye.